Sean Payton is bringing in competition at the wide receiver position and the offensive line. How might it impact the overall projection of the roster? You get that and much more on today's brand new episode, Locked on Broncos. You are Locked on Broncos, your daily Denver Broncos podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What's happening, Broncos country? Welcome into a brand new episode of Locked On Broncos, your daily Denver Broncos podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you so much to everybody in Broncos country for tuning in and making Locked On Broncos your first listen of the day every single day. To get the latest episode as soon as it's available, make sure you subscribe or you follow for free on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm your host, as always, Cody Rourke, Broncos reporter from Mile High Sports, joined alongside, as always, by my co-host. Sarah Bettinger, site expert, predominantlyorange.com. Sarah, you know, over the last few days, the Broncos have added a couple of names to the roster in the late stages of NFL free agency. But in particular, Sean Payton has brought in somebody he has familiarity with at the wide receiver position with more trade rumors surrounding Jerry Judy ramping up. The Broncos bring in Marquez Callaway from the New Orleans Saints. I'm uh, I'm eager for your thoughts on this because there's a lot we're going to have to ponder on. What's your take about this pickup for the Broncos? Well, first of all, on the pickup, Cody, I really like this, right? You know me, I've been clamoring for more wide receivers, right? And I think anybody that's been listening to this show for a while, which shout out to all of you who listen on a daily basis. We love you all. I, You know that I've been wanting wide receivers for the Denver Broncos, and I've been calling out for guys like DJ Shark, Odell Beckham Jr. You and I did an entire episode dedicated to like, okay, who's left out there on the market? Marquez Callaway. He was a restricted free agent for the New Orleans Saints, did not get a tender from them and signed with the Denver Broncos for it looks like a little bit under half of what that restricted free agent tender would be, Cody. So when we look at the the acquisition in terms of, of a financial investment, we kind of knew based on where the Broncos are at with the salary cap, it was going to be a bit of a minimal investment regardless or they were going to have to get a low year one cap hit right so you get Marquez Callaway who had a huge year in 2021 which was Sean Payton's final year with the New Orleans Saints right so you kind of look at that group to me this move Cody one of the biggest things that stands out to me is the context that it is given by some of the other moves and players the Broncos have brought in that are kind of underrated guys we'll talk more about that in a bit Speaking very quickly to the Jerry Judy trade rumors that you that you mentioned, they continue to sit there and, and torture us. Have you ever had to throw up, you know, and, and you're like, man, I just I, I, I really would just like to get this over with. I know I'm eventually going to throw up, but man, I, I just I don't want to be sitting here by the toilet for any longer. Can we stop with the, the this feeling that it's going to happen? Just get it over with. That, that's kind of how I feel like with the Jerry Judy thing at this point, Cody. It's like, if it's going to happen, just let's just throw up, okay? Let's just get it over with. It's not going to be pleasant for anybody. But if it's not going to happen, figure out a way to let us know because I would love to just move forward in some way, shape, or form. Yeah, I, I, you know me. I hate the trade rumors surrounding Jerry. I think it's a massive mistake to trade them. And granted, everybody wants draft capital. George Payton wants draft capital. Broncos fans want draft capital, but... The idea, like, you, you're you not guaranteed that you're going to get a player who's going to be better is going to come in and replace what he was able to do. We've seen him do really great things when made the focal point of the offense. So for me, I hate it. I, if that happens, I will dread it. They, You know, the speculation is it could be before or during the NFL draft. In which it happens, we know Denver does not have a first or a second round pick. We'll see how things formulate here for the Broncos this offseason. But Back to the point of Marquez, Marquez Callaway here. I think he's an underrated pickup for the Broncos. And you, as you and I outlined in our wide receiver episode, you're not necessarily bringing in Marquez Callaway to be this 1,200-yard receiver, 12-touchdown type of guy. You're bringing him in because he can contribute. Not to mention, you know, K.J. Hamler has the torn pectoral muscle, had surgery, is expected to be ready for the start of training camp or a tiny bit afterward. This indicates that there is a position competition at wide receiver. We don't know what the future is of Jerry Judy or Cortland Sutton. We know Tim Patrick is coming back. We know KJ Hamler should be ready for training camp, but that means that there's going to be training camp competition at wide receiver between KJ Hamler, Marquez Callaway, Jalen Virgil, Brandon Johnson, Kendall Hinton, other names to throw out there. 
here is where Callaway can offer value. I mean, it's becoming the Denver Saints at this point here under Sean Payton, but I want to mention what he will be. He'll be a chain mover for Sean Payton's offense if featured in the role, and I think it's predicated off what everybody else does as well inside the offensive structure. In 2020, he had 21 total catches on 27 targets. 10 of those catches were for a first down. Moving the chains, that's impact right there. The big year that you mentioned that he had in 2021 under Sean Payton, his final year in New Orleans, he had 46 total catches. 32 of those catches came for a first down, and obviously he had a career-high six touchdowns that season. 2022, we don't talk about 2022 because for the New Orleans Saints without Sean Payton, it was a dumpster fire, so we'll see how things kind of formulate here. But Marquez Calloway is a guy who can be an impact playmaker if he's moving the chains for you, you know, getting you first downs, extending drives, or if he's even, you know, six foot two, 205, if he's catching touchdowns in the red zone and increasing your efficiency, that is where the value is. So if he comes away with three, four touchdowns a season, I think that's a big win for the Broncos in the offseason considering the market value of the contract. That's how I feel about the Marquez Callaway pickup. I like it. And only three players on that 2021 Saints team, which I I don't know why, Cody. I, I feel like I know more about Maybe it's because of the Sean Payton move. I think subliminally, I kind of think like, man, I feel like I watched more of their games the more I read up on these players that are coming to Denver with Sean Payton. Only three players on that roster offensively played more snaps in 2021 than did Marquez Callaway. He was the number one wide receiver on that team in terms of snaps played. So I think... If people are thinking that this is a, you know, camp body type of pickup in the offseason, I don't think that could be further from the truth. I'm not saying he's going to be Alex Singleton in terms of like, man, he's going to get himself a big contract next year. I'm not going to call that shot from this distance, but I do think it's interesting to me. He he is a very trusted player. You go back and watch that 2021 tape or, you know, highlights it, whatever you want to watch of Marquez Callaway with the Saints. He's catching passes from Jameis Winston, Taysom Hill, Trevor Simeon, uh, Ian Book. There was four different quarterbacks that I noted, Cody, that he caught for big plays. He made big plays for those guys. And specifically, when Jameis Winston was kind of on that record pace, like he was on pace for over 50 touchdowns early in that season, Marquez Callaway was a guy. He brought in a big Hail Mary. He made some crazy one-handed catches for Jameis Winston. I think he had two or three touchdowns in one game for Winston early in that season. So, He's really an intriguing guy. I don't think this is a small move. I think it's a big move at a reasonable, very team-friendly price. Broncos country, we want to know your thoughts on the addition of Marquez Callaway, how it's shaping out considering some of the rumors right now surrounding the Broncos wide receiver position, trade rumors with Jerry Judy, KJ Handler's injury, Tim Patrick coming off of an injury, Cortland Sutton trade rumors. What will the wide receiver room look like? Share your thoughts down below. If you're watching on YouTube, you can tweet us on Twitter at Cody Work NFL, at Sarah Bettinger, at Locked On Broncos. If you're listening on your favorite audio podcasting platform, but on today's episode of the show, is Lloyd Cushenberry's time as a starting center running out with the Denver Broncos with new competition coming in? You'll get that on today's episode of the show. This episode is brought to you by our friends over there at FanDuel, and the tournament is heating up, and there's no better place to get in on the action than FanDuel, America's number one sports book. That's because right now, FanDuel is giving new customers a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's up to $1,000 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. Just go to FanDuel.com slash locked on and sign up today to claim your no-sweat first bet. Then you can wager on everything from the money line to point spreads to which teams will be cutting down the net all on an app that's safe, secure, and super easy to use. So don't miss your shot at a no sweat first bet up to $1,000. When you join FanDuel today, just go to FanDuel.com slash locked on to sign up. Make every moment more with FanDuel. Competition of plenty is expected for the Denver Broncos as they get closer to their offseason program, mandatory mini camp, and then as soon as you know it in July, training camp will be here. There will be competition all across the board, specifically at the center position on the offensive line. Thank you so much, Broncos country, for tuning in and making Lockdown Broncos your first listen of the day every single day. We appreciate you so much for taking time out of your day to listen or to watch us talk all things Denver Broncos. Make sure you get involved down below in the YouTube comment section. Interact with other members of Broncos country. Like the video. Share your thoughts. We always appreciate your insight as well here on the show. Over the weekend, as we said, this is the free agency is pretty much over, Sarah. Like any move that happens is considered like that wave three 
lower tier type move, right? That could have some impact value for the team going forward. But over the weekend, Kyle Fuller, not the cornerback Kyle Fuller that Broncos country knows, but offensive lineman Kyle Fuller, a former seventh round draft pick from the Houston Texans, an offensive lineman is coming over and reuniting with Russell Wilson after spending the past three seasons with the Seattle Seahawks. There's going to be some competition between he and Lloyd Cushenberry at training camp. What is your take here on this pickup, the overall state of the center position, and Lloyd Cushenberry? Well, I think, Cody, if you if at first you don't succeed, just Kyle Fuller again, right? I mean, my gosh, bring just start bringing in other guys that, you know, is there another Jawan James that we can bring in there's as so well? There's so many. Uh, there's, so, there's plenty of those out there, I'm sure. But I actually, you know, all kidding aside, you know, I don't hate this, right? I To me, the center position just feels a bit unsettled for the Denver Broncos. I, they to I think this move indicates maybe – do they really like the center class in this draft, right? Because you've got Lloyd Cushenberry, who he does have quite a few starts under his belt. As far as experience goes, I don't think you're necessarily lacking in the experience department, considering especially Cushenberry, he was, you know, one of the best centers in college football before he got to Denver. So it's not like he's not had a lot of time on task. He's had plenty of time on task. It indicates to me this move does the Broncos either really like Lloyd Cushenberry or they really like the center class in the draft because they could have gone out and they could have signed somebody like Evan Brown. They could have signed Garrett Bradbury. They could have signed any number of these free agent centers and maybe they still will. But really, to me, this looks like the the competition, right? Cushenberry, Kyle Fuller, Luke Wattenberg. It looks like that's the group the Broncos are going to go with and potentially just insert a rookie into that mix. I, I don't know. Do you agree with me on that? Do you think this this move and the guys that they currently have at center, do you think that kind of lends toward maybe they really believe in a lot of the guys at center in this draft class? I mean, it's a great thing to kind of throw out there and ponder because we've seen Denver really emphasize the trenches in the offensive side of the ball. Obviously, with McGlinchey, Powers, Bulls coming back, you already have Quinn Miners there. Really, the only question that we've had here with the offensive line has been center. And so they make this move over the weekend. It tells me, okay, hey, Lloyd Cushenberry, who's still under contract, he's going to compete for the job. Luke Wattenberg, who you drafted in the one of the you know your picks last year in 2022. He's going to compete, but then you bring in this guy as well in terms of Fuller. And I think it's interesting to know, right, when you look at the difference between Lloyd Cushenberry and Fuller, while Fuller's been in the NFL longer, Cushenberry has more career starts than he does. Cushenberry has started in every game in each of his first two seasons. He started eight games last year before suffering that groin injury against the Jacksonville Jaguars, placed him on injured reserve. He was able to come back, but the team held him out. So for me, it was like, okay, what is going on here with Lloyd Cushingberry? I, I do think it is fair, sir, to maybe throw out, okay, for Cush, in his first three years in the NFL, he's gone through two different scheme changes. That definitely, I think, has an impact on it. And if he gets the job this year, he's going to have his third scheme change in four years. How might that impact things? Obviously, a new offensive line coach in Zach Streif who knows what Sean Payton wants and what better way than to get value from a guy who's played for Sean Payton than to you know understand maybe what he wants and what he's looking for. Cushingberry is super, super smart. High football IQ. The biggest issue that we have seen has really been related to strength and physicality, right? That, to me, has been the only thing that where I've seen Cushingberry struggle. Now, I do think it is maybe worthwhile looking at round three, right? Because usually in round three, it's rare you find a guy in the first round or second round who's going to be a, you know, that you're going to draft a, a center. Like, they have to be really damn good in order for you to do that. We've seen some guys in the past, and specifically Sean Payton, do that in the past as well. To me, is there a guy in the, in the third round of the NFL draft with one of your picks, right, you 67, 68, that you feel like if we draft this guy, he's got the strength, He's got guys next to him with Quinn Miners and Ben Powers that will allow him to maybe not have as, you know, much of a, um, you know, much room for error. Like maybe it'll help him having these two guys right next to him. I, I don't know. I I'm think, not opposed to yeah. it, but it's like, okay, if you add a guy in the draft, that means some guy's leaving because you can't have four guys at the center position going into training camp. You simply can't. 
Right. I know. That's what I was going to say too, Cody. I think the more you, the more you talk about it, the more I wonder, like, are, are the Broncos going to go after a guy like, you know, Minnesota's John Jacob Jingleheimer Schmidt, you know, I, or whatever his name, John Michael Schmitz. I, I mean, I don't know, Joe Tipman out of Wisconsin. Are they going to go after one of these guys? I just have no idea where they're going to be at in terms of this class. And remember last year, there was a similar kind of predicament that they were in, right? Remember the tight end position where we came into the NFL draft after wanting anybody in free agency just like hey broncos there's here's a list of the available free agent tight ends just go get one and they didn't really do it remember they brought in eric tomlinson and they brought back eric saubert and things like that and then you go into the drafts with kind of a, an obvious need at tight end and then greg dulcich falls into your lap do you go with a similar type of strat? I guess we, what I've talked about in the past, it's kind of contradictory in a way, isn't it? Because I've said, well, don't go into the drafts with a clear area of need. And then the Broncos just did that last year. So I have to be also mindful that my own personal philosophy is not always what the Broncos do. They may very well go in looking after somebody you know, like John Jacob Jingleheimer Schmidt and, and get after it. You know, <laughs> But I mean, whatever the case may be, Cody, I think the Broncos have an option here with Lloyd. I, I don't know that the team doesn't like Lloyd Cushenberry as little as it seems the fan base likes him or is confident in him. I don't know. I mean, the new coaching staff coming in, you see he's a former third round pick. The Saints took a center that year, so they were obviously evaluating these guys. I think the actions up to this point speak louder than words. We'll see what happens come time for the NFL draft. I think it's fair to ask this question too, right? Do you give Lloyd Cushenberry the chance to secure the job? And, and look, you're right. Broncos fans, you know, I did an article about this competition. I think it's going to be good. You look at Fuller, yeah, he snapped to Russell Wilson before, but he's only started in 10 career games for the Seattle Seahawks, and he's appeared in 40. So that, it goes to show maybe how much they viewed him. There obviously is some familiarity. Russell Wilson has taken snaps from him before, but for Cushenberry, I don't think you could just give up on the guy just yet. You have to at least see what you have with the new coaching staff. As we mentioned, you have voluntary workouts that are coming up in April. You got, you know, mini camp and OTAs, which are coming up after the NFL draft. Like Denver has a chance to evaluate some of these things a little bit early. And then maybe they can make that determination going into training camp. That, okay, we've evaluated this guy. We don't necessarily believe that he's going to offer much in training camp, or we believe that he's going to have a really great chance to compete. To me, that is interesting. But We'll see how things play out. I'm, I'm not opposed either way to Denver taking an offensive lineman at center with one of their third-round picks if it's a guy who's a mauler, right? Because that's really the identity that we're seeing built, at least on paper and free agency. It's physical, smash-mouth, run-the-football-down-your-throat type of offense. At least that's what the moves indicate on paper. So if there's a guy in the draft that you know fits that mold, can come in and do that right away and do it effectively, get clean snaps to Russell Wilson— to me, that's the most important thing. Where we have seen in the past, like there have been some Luke Wattenberg struggles in terms of snapping the ball, you know, accurately to Russ. Lloyd Cushingberry's had some moments throughout his career where he struggled with snapping the ball consistently in place, sometimes to left, sometimes to the right, high, low. You have to avoid these things. You can't be making these mistakes in your fourth year. So I think the pressure is on for the Broncos center position. Broncos country, we want to know what your thoughts are down below with Lloyd Cushingberry, with the idea and the prospects of a draft prospect in the third round of the NFL draft, Fuller and Wattenberg. Drop it down below in the YouTube comment section. We're going to continue our conversation on today's episode of the show. Could the Denver Broncos build a new stadium or should they build onto it? We'll discuss that on today's episode of the show. Real quick, I want to tell you, you make Lockdown Broncos your first listen every single day. Now for your second listen after the show, make Lockdown NFL Scouting with the Draft Dudes part of your day as well. From free agency to the draft, salary cap management, and more, join NFL experts Kyle Krabs and Joe Marino as they take you through what it's like to build a successful NFL franchise every Monday through Friday. Find Lockdown NFL Scouting with the Draft Dudes wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube. Part of the Lockdown Podcast Network. Your team, every day. Should the Denver Broncos build a brand new stadium in the next 10 years, or should they add on to Empower Field at Mile High? The Broncos ownership group wants to know from fans are seeking feedback, and there's a lot of interesting options that are on the table. Thank you so much, Broncos country, for tuning in and making Lockdown Broncos your first listen of the day every single day. Sarah, 
the Broncos sent out a survey to season ticket holders about the prospects of building a brand new stadium or building onto Empower Field at Mile High or moving, you know, building a stadium either, you know, northeast, southwest, northeast. I mean, there's everywhere. I mean, there's different options here in the Denver area where they were looking for feedback. And, you know, do you want to have a dome stadium with a roof? Do you want to have an open stadium? And they sent out examples it's interesting that they're doing this. Now, I think that there are some people who think that they're just going to, whoever votes for what, the amount of times that this gets that, well, that's what they're going to do. That's not what the Broncos are going to do. I would I would hope that would never be the case there because I think it's good to get general feedback on everything, right? Not just like, hey, we're going to ask you this and whatever the top vote is, that's what we're going to roll with. There's a fear from Broncos fans that that might be the case, but I wanted to get your thoughts here on the stadium conversation here, and obviously Broncos Country chiming along as well on YouTube, in the comments, or on Twitter. You can always get involved in the show, but should they build a new stadium within the next 10 years, or should they maybe look to build onto Empower Field a mile high because there's been a, a multitude of players, even J.J. Watt, who said, hey, that is a great stadium that they already have. It's a great atmosphere. It brings you closer to the fans. I'm eager for your thoughts just as as somebody who watches the Broncos who's been to games as well at Empower Field. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess, Cody, here, let's let's get everybody prepared right now, okay? Because here's some <laughs> flaming hot takes. So step away from your computer screen a little bit. Just turn down the volume because these are some scorching hot takes here. I personally, I'm just going to – this this is just straight-up honesty, okay? I hate going to, to sporting events. Hate it. Absolutely hate it. And, and I'm – I'm a homebody by nature. So here's here's where my, I'm at with this. If I'm going to go to to a game, here's the experience that I want to have when I go. You know, I, I don't like going driving downtown, especially on I-25. And I'm sure, Cody, you you have done that more times than I have ever could, will ever fathom doing. But I've done it enough times to think to myself like, man, there, there's a few things in this life that I just rather not do anymore or ever again. And it's drive down I-25 to go see a Denver Broncos game when it's busy, when everybody's trying to go there at the same time. Right. Obviously, you're there early and, and you know, I have problems being late, you know, with that kind of stuff. But sitting in traffic for hours, waiting, getting to the complex or getting to the stadium and then having to park far away. And oftentimes in situations where it's like, man, I don't know is this even a legitimate parking lot or is this guy just taking my $40 or $50 and just like, I don't, am I supposed to even be here walking to the stadium after an unpleasant experience parking far away? You know, I think building a new stadium, building a Broncos mega world. What does our good friend, Mike Cliss say Bronco land? We need Bronco land out there by the new Denver airport, right? The re revamped Denver airport where it's like, Hey, you come, you fly in and somebody like homebody Sayer can go, go to Bronco land and take his kids to, you know, uh, the John Elway roller coaster and then go, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's the experience that I want at a game. I, I'm a, also a purist when it comes to this kind of – I love Wrigley Field. I love the Chicago Cubs. So, like, there's experiences that's like, man, it's legendary to go to this place. Is Empower Field at Mile High that legendary kind of place for me? I don't know. It holds a dear play. There's lots of memories that I have from being there personally. Uh, but, you know, that's just kind of where I am. I would love to see Bronco land out by the airport, Cody. I don't know about by the airport. For me, that's a long drive. I, I hate driving <laughs> to the airport, especially from where I live. It's like a 35-minute drive. For me, though, on game days, I usually leave. I, I go to the stadium probably like five hours early, right? Because I, you know, I can get in, go sit in the press box, watch all the morning games, and just get ready for the day. So I get there early when there's not as much traffic. I have yet to test the theory of getting there two hours before kickoff because – traffic is crazy and I can tell you this there's times like after the game ends I go down you know you go and you go to the press conference with head coach then you go in the locker room interview players even by the time I get out of the stadium traffic is still crazy leaving so that's like an hour and a half two hours after the game even ends where everything is still kind of crazy so for me I, I agree with that experience I, I don't think sitting in, in traffic bumper to bumpers is, is fun in any way shape or form I think you have some valid points, too, about parking. It's a little different. You know, for media, we get closer than, than most people. But, yeah, there's parking so far out where you have to walk. Not only there, it's like you have to remember where you park. If you're from out of town, you have to remember exactly where you parked. 
there's a lot of cool experiences, some tailgates that you can hit up. But that's obviously part of the fan experience. I know that the Walton Penner Family Ownership Group believes in the fan experience. They want them to have a better overall experience as well. So I'm excited to see what the data comes up with and maybe what their plans might be in the future. I'll add my take to it. While you want them to build Bronco land out there, I always feel like, okay, hey, it's it, the stadium's in a great area already, central to downtown. You can build onto it, right? And I think the whole appeal is do you build the dome? Do you build this? Denver's already putting in a massively new scoreboard, which costs $100 million. So do you want to just use that for five or six years and then tear everything down to rebuild the new stadium? I don't know. It's not my money. So then again, it doesn't necessarily affect me. It doesn't necessarily affect Broncos fans because the Walton Penner Family Ownership Group is going to pay for all that. And they did have that loan, which was the $100 million for the new video scoreboard. To me... I believe you can build onto the stadium. You can build around it. You can buy out land. You can buy out residences you know, around it. I know there's apartment complexes, big ones, new modern residential ones that are being built. I don't know about necessarily uprooting people, though. So to me, I don't really have an opinion. I just think it should stay in Denver. It shouldn't be too far away. It shouldn't be too far north. It shouldn't be too far south. I think keeping it central in Denver is where I have my own personal preference. But with that said, Broncos country, we want to know your thoughts down below in the YouTube comment section surrounding the Broncos stadium rumors. Could they build a new one? Should they build onto it? We want to know your thoughts down below. Make sure you drop it in the YouTube comment section. Or if you're listening on your favorite audio podcasting platform, make sure you tweet us on Twitter, at Cody Rourke NFL, at Sarah Bettinger, at Locked on Broncos. That'll do it for today's episode of the show. Make sure you subscribe or follow for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to your podcast so you can get the latest episodes as soon as they are made available every single day, all year long. Sarah and I will have you covered every step of the way here as the Broncos offseason continues. And now the focus shifts towards the NFL draft. We'll have you covered. We'll see you tomorrow for a brand new episode of the show.